morning. Y'all pray. Second Timothy chapter number four, as if you didn't know. It's been up there for a while. It added a little light, it's a little dark in that corner, so I just went ahead and turned it on. Second Timothy chapter number four. Today we're going to talk about uh, this matter of winning a crown of righteousness. This crown of righteousness that we're talking about is that crown uh, for those who are looking for the appearing of Jesus. Now next Sunday's Easter. How many of y'all know that? Amen. Hard to believe, isn't it? Remember last year at Easter we were out in the parking lot? <clears throat> Hallelujah. At least we're in the building this Easter. That is unless if our governor loses his mind between now and next Sunday, right? <laughs> Which, as we've seen, could possibly happen. You never know. But anyway, I think we'll be here next week. But this is the Sunday uh, before Easter. This is historically uh, what's called the Day of Penny. Uh, on this day, the Sunday before Easter or before uh, the Passover, that was the Sunday in which they would bring all the lambs in through the sheep gate into Jerusalem. And it began a process. And the process that took place was every, uh, every day that week. Uh, the high priest and the, the priest would gather together. And they would go through the lambs that were brought in and they would look for blemishes. There were some on the very first day they could just set aside and say, no, uh, they're not good enough for the Passover lamb and they'd set them aside. And then there were others, they would uh, bring them in, they would investigate them and then they would put them in a separate pen and then they would start a, a inch by inch process of investigating the lambs until they found the most perfect lamb uh, that they could find. And then on Thursday is the Passover. That's when the lamb was slain. And that's when Jesus died. And I want you to realize that Jesus came into Jerusalem on that day of Pentecost. I know you all know this because I tell you this every year at Easter. But I want you to understand something. There were only a few people that were really looking for Jesus to come the way that Jesus came. There were only a few uh, that we see at his birth that were really looking for him. And there were only a few in his earthly ministry who really were looking for him and recognized him as the Messiah. Most people just called him rabbi, a teacher. They thought him a prophet. They thought he had special uh, prophetic gifts. But they didn't recognize him as the Lamb of God. But I want you to know something. On the same day in which those lambs came in through that gate, Jesus rode in on a donkey. He was the Lamb of God. Y'all know that, right? And so for those who were truly looking for him, what a day of rejoicing that would have been. You know, Jesus said something very unusual. He said, when I come again, will I find faith on the earth? Now today, we're not here to debate whether Jesus comes pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. I don't care when he comes as long as he comes. Amen. And by the way, he is coming because he said he must. Right. Is everybody okay with that? Right. There's no need to get dogmatic on what's going to happen in the future because we're not there yet. But I believe we're real close. Now personally, I, I tend to hold to a pre-tribulation, pre-millennial view. I like that one the best, and boy, I sure hope I'm right. But if I'm not right, i got a contingency plan. I'm going to keep looking for Jesus to come, and the reason is I really want to win this crown of righteousness. And I hope that Shandler Heights Baptist Church on this day, this Sunday before Easter, you realize what a wonderful day this is, and historically what a, what a wonderful day this was, what a celebration day this actually was to the nation of Israel when all those lambs were brought in because one of those lambs, that blood was going to cover the sins of the people. Little did they know, the vast majority of them had no idea that the Lamb of God rode in on the back of a donkey just like it was prophesied. And that lamb died and didn't cover our sins, but he washed our sins away. And you want to know something? None of those other little lambs ever got back up, but the Lamb of God got back up. On the third day, he arose again. We'll talk about that next week. Today, I want you to understand there's five crowns in the Bible, uh, five crowns that we can win. But I, and we'll start with that. But let's read this scripture. Let's pray. And let's see what God has for us today. Anybody feel distracted today? Good. I'm the only one. That's great. <laughs> My mind's a little distracted. So if I look like I'm a little distracted this morning, it's okay because I am. 
<laughs> Those of you that are spiritual out there, just pray for me. The rest of you, watch the show. Let's see what happens. All right. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter number four, verse number eight. One verse, and then for sake of time today, and we'll jump into this. Henceforth there is laid up for me, that's personal, a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me. That's personal. At that day. Can you say that? I hope you can say that. And not only to me also, or me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. I want you to know this. We're going to pray and jump into this. There is going to be a group of Christians alive when Jesus comes. And when Jesus comes, I want us, if we're here and alive when Jesus comes, I want us to be rejoicing, to be excited, to be anticipating, to be longing for, to be looking for, and to love His appearing. Not be ashamed, but to love it. And I'm going to talk about that today. And there is a way that we can get to the place in our daily walk, in our everyday life, where we are longing for the Lord to come, and when He does come, we will love His appearing. And we won't be ashamed. Let's pray. Amen. Father God, I want to thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, for uh, allowing us the privilege to gather in this building. And I pray, Father, that you would just take this scriptures. And Lord, that you would stir within our heart. And Lord God, today that you might change us and mold us and shape us. And Father, it's not about anything but you today. It's all about you, Lord. And I pray, dear God, that you would show us what we need, not only to be changed and molded, but if there's one soul in this room that's lost, I pray, God, you'd show them what they need for salvation today. And Lord, I just come to you, first of all, in that thanksgiving uh, for, for that. And, and secondly, Lord, I want to thank you for saving a wretch like me. And I thank you that all those years ago, you rode into Jerusalem on that donkey. And I'm going to thank you, Lord, that you went to the cross of Calvary for me. And I'm going to thank you, Lord, that you became my sin. I want to thank you, Lord, that you died for me and that you rose again the third day. I want to thank you, Lord. And I pray now you have your will and your way as you see fit, Jesus. Please, Lord, in, in Jesus' name, amen. I want you to notice, first of all, there's five crowns in the scripture uh, that you can win. How many of y'all know that this morning? Good. Four, five, six of you know that. The rest of you are going to learn something fresh today. There's five crowns. Yeah, get excited. There's five crowns in Scripture that you can win. And I want you to notice what they are. First of all is what's called the incorruptible crown. The incorruptible crown are for those who have victory over flesh, the world, and the devil. And by the way, that is our, our big enemy. That's the three fronts that come against us. I want you to realize we've got to put on the armor of God each and every day in order to stand against the wiles of the devil and in order to overcome our flesh, overcome the world, and overcome the devil. By the way, this is how you do it. You realize that you already are an overcomer. You have overcome the world through Christ Jesus who loves you, died for you, and was risen again the third day for sinners like you and me. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loved us. You can win that incorruptible crown when you realize you already have the victory and live in the power of the Holy Spirit of God and let God work in you and work through you. You find this in 1 Corinthians 9, 24, 25, and it, it says that every man that striveth for the mastery, uh, speaking about those things like uh, those athletes would, would strive to get a trophy, uh, but many strive for the mastery's tempered in all things. Now they that do it to win a corruptible crown, but we do what we do, we for an incorruptible crown. Live for the glory of God, live to the glory of God, live in the glory of God, and live for the glory of God, and you will find you will win an incorruptible crown. If you consistently and continuously yield to your flesh, and you consistently and continuously yield to the devil, and consistently and continually yield to the world without fighting, don't expect to win an incorruptible crown. But nevertheless, we're going to hear, come on in one of these days. Y'all are a tough crowd this morning. Crown of rejoicing. Thank you. Crown of rejoicing is the soul winner's crown. Everybody there? I want you to know you can win the crown, the incorruptible crown, which is a victor's crown. 
You can also win a soul winner's crown. Philippians tells us this. Second, uh, or First Thessalonians 2 tells us this. Uh, it talks about our hope and our joy and the crown of rejoicing. So this crown of rejoicing deals with us going out and winning souls to Jesus. By the way, as you strive to win an incorruptible crown, you cannot help but win a crown of rejoicing. Because the more you are striving to win that incorruptible crown, the closer you walk with Jesus and the more you learn of him and the more you walk in him and allow him to walk in you and through you, you cannot help but tell people about Jesus. It's not up to us to save anybody. All we can do is sow the seed and water the seed. It's God that gives the increase. But how's your sowing? How's your watering? If you're sowing and watering, then keep sowing and keep watering. And don't do it just to win a crown. Remember this, the book of Revelation tells us about those 20 and 4 elders. They take off their crown and lay them at the feet of Jesus. And I believe every crown that we win, we will take off and lay at the feet of Jesus. Because it's not us in our flesh that does anything to earn or win anything. It is God working in us and through then comes the crown of life. This crown of life is the suffering crown or the endurance of suffering crown. You find that referenced in James and you find it referenced in the book of Revelation. Uh, James says this, great blessings belong to those who are tempted and remain faithful. After they have proved their faith, God will give them this crown, this crown of eternal life. And I want you to understand this crown of life or the crown of eternal life. And it is a suffering crown. By the way, have you noticed each of these kind of build upon one another? If you're striving to win that incorruptible crown, you cannot help but be working towards that crown of rejoicing. And the more you work towards that crown of rejoicing, the more you're going to find that you are persecuted in this world. The more you stand for Jesus and the more you vocalize for him, the more you will suffer. But always remember this, all those who suffer with him shall also reign with him. Then there's the crown of glory. This is the shepherd's crown or the pastor's crown. We find this in 1 Peter 5, 14 after he's dealing with pastors and shepherds. He says that when the chief shepherd <coughs> appears that you will receive the crown of glory. And I want you to realize that this is a crown that's given to the shepherds of the church. This is a crown that I ought to strive for. And we ought to strive in doing it by living a life that is dedicated, consecrated, and separated from the world, and alive and for the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to hear me and hear me well. We're all equal at the foot of the cross. Y'all agree with that? There's no super preacher. There's no, none of that super Christian. We're all equal at the foot of the cross. Nevertheless, the pastor is held to a higher standard. The pastor is held to a higher position in the church because God put him there. Everybody with me on that? And I want you to understand that a pastor must live up to the regulations, the stipulations, and everything that's in the Bible. It doesn't matter what the culture says. It doesn't matter how culture goes. And it doesn't matter what culture accepts. God has laid out a specific plan for the life of the pastor. And the pastor must strive and, and work for that to win that shepherd's crown. And that brings us now then to the last one, the one we're going to talk about today. And that is this crown of righteousness. This is the crown for those who love his appearing. It's not, it's not going to be uh, recognized until Jesus appears. But I want you to realize this. There are many people in the past who have already died and gone on to heaven that will win this crown. And the reason they will win this crown is because they were longing for Jesus' return. They were longing to see him. And had Jesus come in their lifetime, they would have been rejoicing. And we'll allow God to be the judge of that because we cannot. Am I right? Because all we see is the outward. It is God that looks upon the heart. And I find this interesting as we look at our text, our scripture, verse number 8, it says, right after verse number 7, this is what Paul said, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, 
which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to unto all them also that love is appearing. What Paul says before he even talked about this crown of righteousness is that he had fought a good fight. He had kept the faith. He's finished his course. He's ready to be delivered. And I want you to grasp this. If you want to win this crown of righteousness, we have to live in such a fashion that we finish our life like Paul finished. We want to get to that day when we're laying on our deathbed, when we can say, I fought a good fight. I've done all that I can do. I lifted up my, my, own, my own soul and made my body. I put my body into subjection to the Holy Spirit of God. I fought a good fight. I fought a good fight against the devil. I fought a good fight against my flesh. I fought a good fight against the world. I stood up against it. I stood contrary to it. And I fought a good fight. What we are facing in our generation are groups of Christian people who are no longer even in the fight. They're not fighting a good fight against the devil. They're not fighting a good fight against their flesh. And they certainly are not fighting a good fight against the world. They have been overtaken and overcome by the things that we just spoke about. Or by the flesh. By the flesh they've been overtaken. And everything they do within the walls of the church are to enhance their uh, feelings and their emotions. Everything is to stir them physically. Everything is to make them feel good emotionally. It's all about their flesh. It's all about their attitude. It's all about their desires. It's all about what they want instead of what God said. God told us that if we are going to be Christians and we're going to live a godly and a holy life, we're going to suffer. We're going to be outcast. We're going to be on the outside. Nobody's going to understand us. The world can't comprehend us. The world cannot understand our love for Jesus and our desire for holiness. They view it as judgmental attitude when in fact what we are is not judgmental at all. We are broken and we are trying to live a holy life for the Lord God Almighty. Amen. They yield to the flesh. They yield to the devil. They allow place in the, to the devil and the devil is destroying them. They're accepting doctrines of the devil. They're accepting the ways of the devil. And I'm talking about in church, y'all. And I'm talking about people in church. They are fully accepting of everything that is evil in the world. Instead of standing holy, we're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be righteous. We're supposed to be in a totally different way of thinking. But the church is allowed it in. They have succumbed to the devil. And the world has a way. And the way of the world is the way of acceptance and the way of tolerance. But you and I cannot live a totally accepting and an intolerant life and a tolerant life. We must hate the things that God hates. And we must love the things that God loves. We must stand firm on the truth. And we must not bow down to the things of the world. When the world says this is totally acceptable now, if it's not acceptable in the Bible, we don't accept it. And therefore, we are not tolerant. Are you all listening to me? The world views us then as, as being some kind of an arrogant person. We're not arrogant. We're not above. As a matter of fact, we're very far below. Because we realize what we were in our flesh. But thanks be unto God that he died for us and he saved us. And he changed us. Amen. Amen. Now let's go on. So winning this crown of righteousness. How many of y'all would say right now this morning before we get any further, I want to be, I want to be excited at Jesus' return. I want to long for his return. I would love to just be here when Jesus comes back. Amen. Well, I'm going to tell you, if you are here when Jesus comes back, you will have just gone through some sorrowful times. You will have just gone through some hard times. I want you to understand that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. The world is getting more corrupt. It's getting harder and harder and harder to live as a biblical Christian. And I'm here to tell you, it's getting harder and harder and harder to be a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching pastor in our generation. Everybody wants to accept the ways of the world. Everybody wants to bring the worldly attitudes into the church. And if it's accepted now by this church and accepted now by that church and accepted by that group and that group and that denomination, this denomination, 
then somehow the pastor must be some old-fashioned bigot in something or another, and he don't accept it in his church. And I'm here to tell you, those of us who want to stand firm on the Word of God, as pastors, we're getting fewer and fewer and fewer. Compromise is everywhere. Everywhere. They will compromise their beliefs now because it's now in their life. Look, I'm here to tell you the Bible says what it says. And the Bible is very clear about things. And we must not deviate from it. Everybody with me on that. So winning the crown of righteousness. As a pastor, I want you to win that crown of righteousness. As a Christian, I want to win that crown of righteousness. As believers, we ought to want to win that crown of righteousness. Because we want to lay it at the feet of the one who's worthy to win it. Which is truly not us. But Jesus, watch this. We need to learn, first of all, to walk circumspectly. That word circumspectly means cautious and watchful. Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. See then that you walk circumspectly, cautious and wise. Not as fools. Not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time. Because the days are evil. The Bible tells us that the days are evil. We don't have to be told the days are evil, but thank God he did tell us. All you got to do is look around. The days were evil in that day. The days are evil in this day. Every day is an evil day because we're living in a sin-cursed world. We live in a sin-cursed body on a sin-cursed world. Nevertheless, Christian, nevertheless, you are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. You've been given the Holy Spirit of God that teaches you right from wrong. You've been given the Holy Spirit of God that comforts you, that edifies you, that chastens, corrects, convicts, rebukes you. You've been given the Holy Spirit of God that allows you to discern truth from error. You've, got, you've been given the Holy Spirit of God that allows you to stop and look at the world in which you live in and look at the church in which you worship in and find out do they, do they match what the Bible says. Because the world in which we live in, it matches what the Bible says. Evil men and seducers waxing worse and worse. In the last days, perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of themselves and, and blasphemers and boastful and proud. We see that everywhere, don't we? Right. So the Bible tells us true about the world. Now what we need to do is evaluate our place of worship. Is our place of worship a place where Jesus is welcome? Is our place of worship a place where we magnify Christ? Is our place of worship a place of preaching? Preaching of the cross where Jesus is lifted higher than any man. Is it a place where the preaching is all biblically based? It's based upon the scripture. Is the place of our worship the place where the man of God lines up with the word of God? Because huh. that's a major problem in our generation. In our generation, we got a lot of men who start really well. But life happens to them just like life happens to the rest of us. And then they start justifying their actions. They don't justify them by Scripture. They twist Scripture to justify themselves. They will justify themselves by what other men in other places have done. Since when is that ever a good idea? Since when is it ever a good idea for you, dear Christian, to evaluate yourself against another person? We come to the Word of God, and we come to Jesus Himself, and we find that we all fall short, don't we? Everybody with me? So the Bible says that we're to walk circumspectly. If you want to win this crown, if you want to win this crown of righteousness, and you want to win the crown of righteousness at Jesus appearing so you can lay it at His feet, you've got to be righteous. You've got to be different from that world out there so that when you gather and assemble yourself in the body of worshipers, we call it the church because the Bible calls it the church. And when we gather together as a, a called out assembly, the ecclesia, the church, then we who are called out to gather together to worship God must worship Him circumspectly. As we walk circumspectly in that world, We've got to walk as wise and not fools. What does that mean? We're to be wise in the things of God. We're to be wise in the word of God. We're to be wise in the nature of God. And we are to be wise 
in our own actions, our own attitudes, our own language. Our speech betrays us. Right? So we've got to walk circumspectly. When you go to the doctor's office, and you go to Walmart, and you go to, to your class reunions, you're a Christian first. A Bible believer first. You're bought and paid for with the blood of the Lamb of God first. That's why we walk away from things that are sinful. That's why we abstain from the evil things and the sinful things. That's why we shun those evil and profane things of the world. And we are to be different. Let's talk about it in our church. In our church, the places where we gather to worship, if we have a desire to win this crown, we've got to make sure that in this place, we do what the Bible says that we do. We worship Him and not man. That's right. And we set a permanent place of the Bible and not the philosophies and the theosophies of the world. <laughs> not the theology of denominationism. But theology of the scripture. Everybody with me? That's to win that crown of righteousness. First and foremost, we must walk circumspectly. Second, we must walk purposefully. How many of y'all understand that whole circumspectly walk? It deals with our holiness, doesn't it? It deals with our hearts, our attitudes, our actions. It deals with our mannerisms and our customs. Both in the world as well as in the church. Then we are to work purposefully. Look at this scripture. Colossians 3. Y'all with me this morning? Yeah. Colossians 3. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Let's back up just a minute. Look at the scripture. Whoops, I went too no, I didn't. There we go. Look at the scripture one more time about walking circumspectly. If we're to walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. It goes hand in hand with walk, working purposefully. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. You and I need to understand that when we're out there in that world, we are to walk circumspectly, but we are to work purposefully in that world. If you've got a job and a man pays you to do the job, do the job. If you don't like the job, go find another job. Right. But do what you're paid to do. Don't stand around and talk about Jesus if you're not doing the work you're supposed to do. Don't tell them to go to Shadow Heights Baptist Church if you're beating in time and stealing from the God. Right. Get right with God. Do the work you're supposed to do. Take the pay you agreed to take and go home and live your life with your family. You don't live for work. Work is a means to be able to take care of your family. Everybody with me? And then at the same time in our place of worship, everything we do, we ought to do it heartily as to the Lord, not unto men. I see many times in our world today where we have people serving in the church and they serve in the church in order for people to look at them. We must never do that. We're not to draw attention to ourselves. We're constantly to point to Jesus. And by the way, he's hired in a cross. He died on the cross, went into a grave, and now he is risen again. He's seated at the right hand of God. He's seated at the right hand of God, and one day soon and very soon, he's coming again. Do you see how all that works? And this crown that we want to win is the, the crown when Jesus comes, and we're ready for his coming, and we're excited at his coming. It starts with our walk, and it, our walk is really a lot about our work. I'm struggling with some things today. I'm struggling with some news that I hear today. I'm struggling with some news I hear that's going on all around this country. And what's going on around this country is that the work of the Lord has been replaced with social work. The work of the Lord that we do when we're out in the world, we are to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Y'all know that. You see somebody hurting, you want to help them. You see somebody broken, you want to take them to the one who can fix them. You see somebody in the world who has no hope, you want to tell them of the one who gives them hope. Am I right? 
That's our work. We sow the seed. We water the seed. God gives the increase to salvation. But now inside the church, I want you to understand, our work primarily and for, forthrightly is not to feed and clothe the poor. Our work primarily is, is not to, to be a shovel service for people. Our work primarily is not to engage in Sunday school classes and VBS. That's not our primary work. Our primary work is to magnify Jesus, to love him, adore him, and serve him. Our primary function of work inside the body is to edify one another, pray with those that need some prayer, to rejoice with those that rejoice, and to weep with those that weep, and to edify, lift up our brothers, to live a godly example among the brethren. That's the outward of our work. Is everybody following me? But you and I need to understand what's taking place now in our world is that the church has shifted into this social justice mindset. And now the work of the church seems to be a social justice and, and race relations. You cannot have race relations with anybody that does not want them. End of story. And we don't owe, we're predominantly white in this place, we don't owe any black people anything. Amen. I didn't own slaves. Right. My family didn't own slaves. Right. My grandpa came to this country after World War I. He lived in abstract poverty. And he built his own life. I don't owe him anything. And I have no problem saying that. The church is not about equal anything. We certainly are not about equal rights. Do you understand that equal rights is a worldly mindset? In the church, you don't work, you don't eat. End of story. That's biblical. But oh, we got to have equal rights. Gender roles. Gender rights. You know what the Bible says, ladies? You'd be a keeper at home. You'd be obedient to your own husband. But may God help the preacher who's biblical today to even preach from those texts. We're not ready for Jesus to come back. We're setting ourselves up for the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to be the biggest social justice warrior you have ever seen. He comes in the first three and a half years as all false peace. And when he comes in, it's all about unifying and uniting people together. And I told you the other week, and I'll tell you today, Jesus does not unify people together. He divides. It's his way or it is hell's way. End of story. And our churches are so focused on this stuff that we can't even give the gospel because now people are saying Jesus is a racist. And Jesus was a homophobe. And Jesus was this and that. Jesus is God. Amen. What Jesus said, what God said, we must believe it and we must walk it. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. I'm finding today more and more I fit in less and less with not only the world, I haven't fit in with the world since I was 25, but I find I fit in less and less in the church world. Less and less. Less and less in pastoral world. I'm so on the outside. <laughs> so on the outside <clears throat> I will not bow and I will not yield and I will not capitulate to this social justice movement of this world Amen. but I will yield I will bow and I will capitulate to the holiness of the word of God which to this world looks like we're arrogant which looks like we're judgmental which looks like we are something that they should hate 
Might I remind you, they don't really hate us. It is Jesus in us that they hate. And the longer we spend serving Christ, and the longer we spend learning of Christ, and the longer we spend allowing Christ to live in us and through us, the less like this world you're going to find, you're going to find you fit. And the less like the church world that the church is becoming, will you fit. And that's okay. <laughs> because when Jesus comes, we'll be ready. We'll be long. We'll be looking. And we'll be hungry for him to come. Y'all with me? Yeah. Let's keep going. Where's my clicker? There it is. Look at the third one. We are to suffer patiently. You see, suffering isn't really that we're outsiders. It isn't really that we don't fit in with the world or that we no longer fit in with the church. True biblical and Christian suffering is actual suffering. Look at this. Romans chapter number 5. I'm going to show you a couple verses. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. When the world comes against the church, there will be tribulations. He's not talking about the great tribulation period. He's talking about the, what the word tribulations mean. The word tribulations has the idea of severe persecution, strong persecution, strong suffering that will come to you. Knowing that tribulation works patience. Patience, experience, experience, hope. Hope make it not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Look at 1 Peter 5. But the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory. And by the way, isn't that what God has called us unto? This world is temporary. We're just passing through. We might as well live to the glory of God. We might as well walk purposefully. We might as well walk circumspectly. We might as well be prepared to suffer. And we must determine we will suffer patiently. Because one day we will be delivered from this world. Notice what Jesus said after you have suffered a while. Make you perfect. We ain't perfect now. Look up here now. I'm finding a lot of narcissists. In the leadership of church today. Amen. A lot of narcissism. What is narcissism? Hey, look at me. Hey, look at me stuff. I'm finding a lot of this narcissism, and the narcissists of this church world that we live in are not pointing us to suffering, but they're telling us we're headed towards a great revival. Well, I beg to differ. Because the Bible does not tell us that there is a great revival in the last days. The Bible tells us that we're going to be marginalized in the last days. We're going to be ostracized in the last days. We're going to be persecuted in the last days. The Bible does not tell us anything at all about a great revival until Jesus Christ steps foot and when his foot touches this ground, it's the beginning of a great revival. Last for a thousand years. But until that day happens, the world is going to grow darker, bleaker, more evil. And the church is going to go through a great falling away. We are seeing it in our midst. What are they falling away from? Look at this. They're falling away from this kind of preaching, they're falling away from this kind of, of teaching. They're falling away from these kinds of scriptures. When was the last time you heard Joel Osteen stand up and rejoice in the fact that we're going to suffer for Jesus? Oh, no. To him, you would never suffer. This is your best life now. This is your greatest day. Every day ought to be your Friday, or whatever that stupid book was. <laughs> Are y'all listening to me? You listen to the modern-day theologians of the world. You listen to all the head honchos and the big denominational leaders around the Baptist world, and this is what you're going to hear. We need to do all we can do so that we can make sure that everybody feels welcome in the church. We need to do all we can do to make sure that we are, are just filling people with hope and glory and good stuff. That's not what Jesus said. 
That's not what the Bible teaches. Certainly we're to give people hope, but hope only comes in Jesus. Amen. And the hope of Jesus is his great glorious appearing. What is our blessed hope? The glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's our hope. So if you want to give the church hope, you need to teach them about winning this crown of righteousness. And winning this crown of righteousness, especially for us, the closer we get to the last days, it's going to be harder and harder and harder. <laughs> and when we go through the tribulations that we're going to go through, and we haven't hit them yet. Right now, we're upset because we don't have a president that agrees with us. Right now, we get all bent out of shape because the laws of our land seem to be going against us. Wait till they string you up by your ankles and start to fillet the skin off of your body. Wait till they pour gasoline on you and light you on fire. Wait till they take sharp sticks and poke your eyes out. Wait till they hold your young pregnant wife up in front of you and cut her baby from her womb. Then impale the baby upon a stick and laugh and mock you and joke. You see, we don't want that kind of Christianity anymore. America doesn't want to hear that kind of Christianity anymore. We're filling our pulpits with teachers, not preachers. Teachers will take and they'll expound on the scripture, give you the information, all the good stuff about it. Preachers are filled with the Holy Spirit. Preachers are just delivering the message that God burdened down their heart with. And churches today are saturating themselves with teachers. And they call it preaching. You know it and I know it. They'll want to tell you four ways of this and five ways of that and seven ways of this. And they'll give you your little Bible verses and you can go home feeling like you've just been to a Sunday school picnic. But they can't preach. They can't preach because they've never really been called. They can't preach because they've never really been broken. And they can't preach because their lives do not measure up to this book. But all they can teach. And the devil will fill the pulpits with them. And they'll teach, 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 teach. Then when a preacher comes along, the people don't want it. They can't handle it. They can't take it. When the preacher who stands in a position of prophet in the New Testament Stands and says, the Lord has said this. There will be tribulation. Oh, no. No, 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 no. No, 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 Pastor Paul. Just teach me about Jonah and the whale. Teach me about Jesus dying on the cross and paying my sin. Debt. Teach me. Teach me. But please don't preach. Because when you preach, it hurts me. It makes me realize I'm not ready. I'm not longing to go home. And I'm not really ready for Jesus to come back. I've got so many more things I want to do. The church, God said, He gave preachers. Preachers call men to holiness. And a preacher who has not lived a life of holiness cannot call you to holiness. But he can teach you. And it sounds so good. Y'all still there? James 1, 2, and 4, my brethren counted all joy fall into divers temptations. Why do you think that verse is there? If Christians aren't going to fall into temptation, trials, tribulations. Romans 8.18 is here. 
for those Christians who have gone through. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worth to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You see, one day, Christian, once we've been tried, once we've been tribulated, we're going to be rewarded. And part of that reward is that we're longing for Jesus to come. <clears throat> you want to know why American Christianity is so weak and so frail and so vain? Because we are not living as though Jesus could actually come at any moment. We are living as though we got a thousand years before Jesus comes. There's nobody in this room that has a thousand years to live. And you could face God at any moment. And we need to be ready every moment to meet Him at Suffer patiently. Fight faithfully. We need to fight a good fight. What did Paul say? Fight the good fight of what? Faith. faith. What's faith? Faith is the word pistesis. It's that which is based upon fact. We have faith in our God based upon what the word of God says. And we are to lay hold. Lay hold on eternal life. This is not all there is. We have an eternity to truly live. Let's lay hold on that life. Whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I want you to understand this. This doesn't really relate to this verse, but loosely. But I want you to grasp this. You've heard me say this before. I want you to understand it. There's coming a day when the Lord's going to call us to Himself. We ought to be ready for that day, longing for that day, hungry for that day. But I want you to understand all tears are not wiped away until after the great white throne. Amen. And at the great white throne judgment, there are going to be many people sitting in this room, maybe some. that are going to be at that great white throne judgment standing before the judgment seat of God. The great white throne is the mega Lucas throne us. And it means the exceeding white and fearful seat of the great potentate, the king of kings. It's a fearful thing. Those of us which are called to be, to be with the Lord, we're ever going to be with the Lord. And so we're there, we're in a cloud of witnesses over here. There'll be people that are allowed to go up and see if their name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And there will be pastors. And there will be theologians. And there will be church members. And there will be all kinds of church goers. We're going to be looking for their name. They'll hear the words, depart from me, cursed and everlasting. I never knew you. We need to fight for the faith today. Because just as sure as our churches have gone into social justice mindset, just as sure as we're filling our pulpits with teachers, we need to understand the preaching of the cross. That's how many are saved. It's through the foolishness of preaching that men are saved. We need to fight for the faith because the true faith has morphed into a false faith. The true faith is we are dirty, disgusting sinners. Desperately in need of a Savior. We must yield. We must repent. And put our trace, trust and faith in Christ. Are you all with me? And what has taken place is work. What is taking place is action. What is taking the place of repentance and belief is simply a false narrative, a false gospel, a false salvation. Well, we're good people. We do the best we can. I prayed that prayer. I went in that water. I'm just as good as anybody else. 
Well, we're all Christians. We're Americans. We're a bunch of God denying demons in our world and in our churches. And we need to learn to fight for the faith. Because there ain't a whole lot of kids being raised up in church right now. This COVID thing has knocked our families out. You're here, and I'm thankful for you. And in the next service, we'll have a whole bunch more adults. Got a handful of kids. And it's not just our church. But you go to the churches that magnify the teaching of the preaching. And magnify the experience over Jesus. And you're going to find all kinds of things. And they're being told a false time to fight for the faith. And then while we're waiting, we need to wait patiently. Is everybody still with me? i got like two minutes and I'll be finished. As we live contently, we are actually waiting patiently. Let your conversation, your manner of life, be without covetous. Ain't nothing wrong with having money. There's nothing wrong with having stock. Nothing wrong with being able to give to other people. Nothing wrong with being able to have other people give you things. This matter of covetousness is that you live for stuff rather than live to see Jesus come. When you get it in its proper perspective, and I'll tell you this, to my shame, I had it backwards for many years. For many years, I lived for stuff. I thought, hey, he who dies with the most toys wins. He who dies with the most toys still dies. The toys are fun. They're fun to play with. <coughs> but they're not the purpose of your life. And you can have all the Lord allows you to have. And by the way, we live in America. We've been blessed. You might as well enjoy it now because you're about to lose it all. <laughs> You're going to be taxed to your eyeballs hurt. Y'all listening? I want you to understand something. Just live contently until Jesus comes. If the Lord gives you a nice house and a nice car, then praise God. If the Lord gives you a house with a leaky roof and gives you a car that the wheels fall off every other day, praise God. We are to be patiently waiting and living contently. Be content with such things as you have. If you got a bunch, be content. You got a little, be content. You got somewhere in the middle, be content. Our contentment comes from Jesus. And long and looking for him to come. Y'all with me? Now watch this. Notice this. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my help. It's not about what you got or don't got. It's that you're content with what you do have or don't have so that in the middle of it you can say, Woo! Look what the Lord has given me. And realize I deserve nothing but hell. But thank you, Jesus. Godliness with contentment is a great game. We brought nothing to the world. We carry nothing out. You came in this world naked and screaming and some of you might leave the same way. I'm done with this. Here's hope for his appearing. Are you ready for Jesus to come? Are you ready? Now this was a hard message, wasn't it? It was tough. But you and I need to understand where we are as Americans and understand where our culture is and where our churches are. Are you individually ready? I can't answer that for you. But I can tell you this. All the things that I have that God has blessed me with some of the things that I think he has allowed me to be cursed with. I would gladly let them go if I could go home and be with Jesus today. But I can't go home and be with Jesus today if today is not my day. So if today is not my day, then I must learn in this day to walk circumspectly. I must work purposely today. 
I must suffer patiently if, su if suffering comes my way. I must fight faithfully, fight for the faith today. And I must be content with this day. And at the same time I am content with this day, I must not be content with the things that God's not content with. That is this great falling away that's in, a, in the church. We must love the things God loves and hate the things that God hates. And we must do what God wants us to do. We're losing. Those of us that are saved, we're victors. We're conquerors. We're not living like victors. We're not working like victors. We're not walking like victors. We're not living, walking, or working like conquerors. We're walking like the devil's already defeated us. He's the prince and power of this world. And this world is going to hell. But we're not. We must rise above it, brethren. We must understand that when we see churches that are going the way of the world, they have yielded to Satan. And they have yielded to the flesh. When we see pastors compromising the truth, to fit their own circumstances and situations. We need to understand that they have yielded to the flesh, they have yielded to the world, thereby yielding to Satan. We must do all we can do to stand up for what's true and what's right. Are you ready? Let's all stand this morning. Revelation.